I'm going to record at least parts of today. Um, so I'm not able to give you back your quizzes yet. I still need to have um, Aaron make that up so Aaron can chat. Um, we need to schedule before we leave today. So make sure that you do that with me at the end. Um, for homework, um, I have a feeling we'll probably do a little bit of 77, which we are kind of ending with today. We'll probably do a little bit of that for next time too. Um, but we're going to be focusing on 78 for Monday. So we'll probably do a little 77 and then some 78 on Monday. And then if you look ahead, you'll see that we have another quiz on Baroque next Thursday. And the reason I am putting Baroque all by itself, even though it's like really just one style, is that there are a lot of artworks in this unit. So I thought instead of grouping it with another big unit, we'll just do it by itself. Once we're done with Baroque, we're going to move on to um, artistic styles before colonization. Because we're when we're looking at Baroque, we're really talking about this time of colonization. So we will go to um, America and look at art from um, North, Central, and South America, and then we'll go to Africa. So, um, any questions? So, last time, we were looking at Velasquez. We were looking at some Spanish art. And you know that the Spanish were major colonizers of the Americas. So we're going to look at some colonial painting from the Americas today. So our first piece is called Spaniard, oh, love you up coming in. Spaniard and Indian produced a mezzo. And so I and so we know who the artist is. It's Juan Rodriguez Juarez. And this is a pretty common piece um, from the America. And we call this a pasta piece. We call this a pasta painting. And so we're probably going to need to define pasta. And we're also probably going to need to define um, mezzo because you probably since it's in the name, you probably need to know that too. Does anyone know what a pasta painting is? Does anyone know offhand what that is? Oh, it is hot. Thank you. So we are on Spaniard and Indian, thank you. Um, and so here we have a pasta painting, right? So looking at it, does that help you define what you think a pasta painting is? Okay, it is a painting that documents the mixing of races in what we call New Spain. So when Spanish colonized the New World, they named it after their own, you know, their own region. So they called it New Spain. And this one was made in Mexico. So what this is going to show is the blending of natives to Mexico with Spanish who came to conquer. Okay? And so a mezzo is a person of mixed race. This is really a common kind of image. So let's focus on who is depicted. Who are the different characters in this painting? Take a moment. And then I'm going to pick on someone. So who do we think these four people are? Okay, Raphael, can you help me? Who do you think these four people are? What's some visual evidence that helps them figure that out? Um, I'm not sure, but I guess like a Spanish family. I'm sorry, of course it's hard for me to hear you. Can you repeat that one more time? I said a Spanish family. Okay, so we have a Spanish 
short word Spanish, just so it can sort of say, right? So we have him. Who are these other three people? Who can help out? The man is the Spaniard, and the woman is and the children are the mestizos. Let me see the volume here. This is really soft today. See if the teacher turns it down. Okay, I'm so sorry. Technical letters. Go ahead, repeat that. The man is the Spaniard. The woman is the Indian and their children are mestizos. Okay, it's almost correct. Their child is the baby. The child is the baby. So the older child would actually be a servant. But I can totally understand why you would think that they're all related. So we have basically a portrait of a family. That's the content of this painting. It's a portrait of a family. And when we look at them, we can see that the father, right, with the visual evidence, he is totally from the West. He's wearing latest of French fashion. He's got a powdered wig. He's got a velvet suit. He has a really nice scarf, right? And he's very white, very white, almost opaque, right? He's almost like pure, like he's, he's kind of glowing bright, right? And then when you contrast, his skin tone to his wife, you can see that he married someone native. So he married an indigenous Mexican woman. And so when we look at her, from the skin tone, we can see that she's darker, but also from her clothing, we can tell that she has traditional Mexican textiles woven into her dress. And so it's really common to kind of identify um, races based on those cultural signifiers. Then we have their baby, right? And then we have a servant. And you'll notice that the servant is also darker, right? She's, he's also dark. This is really common to portray the family in like a religious sort of way, uh, kind of reminiscent of like the holy family of Mary, Jesus, and Joseph, right? These types of paintings were really common during the Enlightenment. And the Enlightenment was this is a little bit older than some of the other Baroque pieces that we're looking at. You know, this is coming from like the 17th and 18th century. And what was basically happening is this time of like scientific like investigation. And they were trying to classify. So the same way you would classify insects, right? They were trying to classify people. And so there was a whole series of very racist paintings being made. made. And it was really common to try to show as many different blendings of race as possible. Um, often there were like 16 different classifications and they were often painted together. And so they would show what would happen if the, the father was like native and was a white mother, or if it was an Afro, like someone who came from Africa, like was enslaved in the colonies, what that would look like if it blended with someone who was indigenous, right? Or if someone was white. And so they went through and it all kind of reflects this enlightenment need to kind of classify everyone. And the, when I say that it's very racist, often people are really dark and poor looking if they're like the least favorable blending of races, according to the Spanish of the day, right? This thinking that they, of course, were a superior race coming into this area of you know people that they have to kind of control. And so there's all this different um, dress and costume and ways of showing people either doing pretty well, right, being very affluent based on their ethnicity, or being very poor and sometimes ignorant if they're a, 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 a blending that they didn't approve of. So here is like the last one. And so I tried to enlarge it as best I could. It's a little fuzzy, 
but you can see how dark and kind of how shabby they're dressed. Um, they're not really shown in a very favorable light. So for the one that we have, right, it's definitely not the one that's like overtly like, oh, this is a horrible blending, this is a horrible mixing. But what we have is, um, you know, one that's a little bit more um, like just a typical portrait. And so who are these made for? These are made for the viscerai, right? The viscerai. And so viceroys basically were Spanish who went to the New World who ruled in position, excuse me, in place of the king, right? So everything that they did in the New World, they were basically seen as the king. So the king's decisions were brought to the New World, and the viceroy are the ones who implemented, right? They're bureaucrats. And of course, they came to the New World looking for land and gold and silver and a workforce. So this is probably, the viceroy is probably the guy on the right. Right? Questions on... Questions on this one. You can also just see technical, it's oil paint, right? It looks, you know, modeled three-dimensionally. It has that dramatic lighting that's characteristic of Baroque. Okay, the next painting we have is also from the Americas. This is Portrait of Sor Juana um, by Miguel Cabrera. And so, some of you might already know who she is. But if you don't, we're going to watch a short video. I think I can put pause the recording because this is probably copyright. So I'll try to remember to re record. Whoopsie. I feel bad. So I'm going to just say a couple of things real fast. I forgot to hit the re record. So here is your list. Feel free to pause it, right? Of what she's why she's important and the digital ambient. She's depicted in a similar way to gospel writers and other scholars of the day. Okay. Okay, so the theme for Baroque, if it's not Baroque, don't fix it. It's of course like a really bad, bad joke here, right? So Baroque art is often just another like step off from Renaissance. It's basically the characteristics of Renaissance with some extra. Okay, so they're exaggerated characteristics of the high and the late Renaissance, as well as some mannerist characteristics. There's often still a lot of reference to classical and Hellenistic characteristics from the ancient world. The style is international. So when I say international, I mean that we're going to see it in many different regions in Europe and, of course, in the New World as well. So we saw it a little bit later, like those last pieces we saw were a little bit later at the end of Baroque and like the beginning of what we call neoclassicism, romanticism. Um, and the style, there's kind of, I would say like two different dominant styles, both of them basically coming from Italy. One is by the artist or the group of artists with the last name Caracci, and then the last one is Caravaggio. Now, we're going to focus on Caravaggio. They didn't put any Karachi in the 250s. And this style exists for about 150 years, right? So the general characteristics of Baroque, there's a lot of them. Um, it's still very classical. I would say one of the ones that you probably want to make sure you jot down is there's a lot of emotional rather than intellectual content to the artwork. So, Baroque is basically the Hellenistic of the Renaissance. Okay, so it's kind of just a later version of the Renaissance. It's very Hellenistic and that it's very emotional. They often exploit the most dramatic moment of a subject. So when telling a story, we normally have paintings of that climactic moment. To make it more dramatic, they often use dramatic lighting. 
And so there's like a spotlight effect, especially in the work that's inspired by Caravaggio. Typically, these paintings are put at eye level. And so because they're eye level, it invites the, the, the viewer to pick up, become a participant in the artwork. In the compositions, there's a lot of diagonals because diagonals are definitely more complex and dramatic than horizontal and vertical elements. Um, they often layer using overlap to create depth. Um, the painting style is often looser. So uh, uh, Velasquez is a great example of this. Remember Princess Margarita and how feathery her hair is and how you can see the visual brushstroke of her dress? That's pretty common, common um, of many of the artists. Rich colors, use of multimedia. You're going to see this together. Um, work is very theatrical. And so there's often like a multimedia extravaganza going on. So they're going to have architecture that's designed for the paintings or the sculpture. And there's going to be sculptural components to the art display. And then there's going to be painting. So it's like there's an integration of architecture, sculpture, and painting for one visual impact. There's a move away from idealism to realism. So basically, that means there's a move from perfection to what people really look like. We call that naturalism. And then there's a bunch of different themes here. Part of the reason there's the different themes is that we're post Protestant Reformation, right? And so we are post Counter Reformation. So we'll have religious imagery, but we'll also have you know, images from mythology, portraits, still life. Genre scenes, which are scenes from everyday life, we even have landscapes, right? And so that leads us to Il Hezu. So this, we have basically two Baroque slash late Renaissance um, buildings. So we're going to look at Il Hezu by um, Giacomo della Porta. He's the architect who designed it. And then we're going to have a painting on the interior. So we've got two images or maybe three images of this um, building. And so we're going to look at what the function of the church is, um, who made it, which we got there in the title, and then how does the de design reflect the function. So we're going to go ahead and watch this, at least for a little bit. Beth Harris and Frank DeBell, an art historian in, in Rome. And we're standing outside an extraordinary church. We're standing in the middle of traffic, essentially. It's really a part of traffic island, but we are in the midst of Rome. We're very close to the Pantheon and 10 minutes from the Forum. And that explains the centrality of this church, founded as the mother church of the Jesuit order in the mid to late 1500s after the death of St. Ignatius Loyola, its founder. And the church is called the Jesu, which simply means Jesus. And this uh, is a glorification of the name of Jesus. And you can actually see it right there, blazoned on the, on the facade of the yeah, church. IHS, which is sometimes read in Latin, sometimes in Greek, as an interpretation of the letters of Jesus' name. And we also see the name of the patron. The name of the patron is very important, Alexander Farnese, enormously rich, powerful, and art-loving Cardinal, I might have you standing in the pouring rain. Should we run inside? I think let's run in. As we walk in here now, although the color is gorgeous, it's, it's softened because it's dark. It's dark today because it's, it's cloudy. As you can hear, we're still in the heart of Rome with, with the sirens going on. But this is the point where the sound of it reminds me. This is something that is turned up loud. Yes. This is loud and it's loud and clear. This is a very rational space, with it all, with the Baroque's appeal to the 
people's sex, the imagination rather than the intellect. This is really the life of both the senses and the mind, because there is a sense of focus. And it's not a complicated space. We come back to that name of Jesus on the ceiling, which, which encompasses the theme of the whole church. So it seems as if that notion of simplicity, that I don't, I, you can never use the word spare here, but you can say that there has been a sort of removal of, through the Council of Trent. Yes, yeah. well, the Council of Trent wants a directness and simplicity. This looks very ornamental because it's the materials themselves, but if you analyze the materials, you could even say that they're spare because they're classicizing. Yes. They are the kind of uh, flitting Corinthian columns and pilasters that we would see in Renaissance churches. It's just that they're made of Sicilian jasper and ochre marble and all sorts of other rich materials, some of them actually spoliated, that is, recycled pieces from uh, ancient Rome. We don't know exactly what, but it was a common practice to, to rebuild the new Christian Rome out of its ancient, quote unquote, pagan past. So we've got this little focus on the altar, the real removal of the aisles as a space for traffic. Yes, there's a space for individual chapels on the sides, but the, the emphasis is on the great space. And above us, of course, is huge, um, explosive scene with frescoes and the choir end, the name of Jesus in a Starbucks made of gilded bronze. And both of them relate very closely to something that already existed in Rome in, in the earlier Baroque period, and that is Bernini's great apse decoration in St. Peter's, where you have a similar burst of mm -hmm. uh, light mm -hmm. coming in that case from the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. The dove was a piece of stained glass that where the, the wall dissolves. Where the wall yeah. dissolves. This oh, is this is going mm -hmm. from the earthly to the heavenly, from the secular, from us standing right. here to the sacred, of course, from matter to spirit. But it's made of raw matter, it's made of stucco. Some of it is very cheap material, it's just painted stucco, but it's theater. And that is what we do. Even when we go to the theater in the movies, we explode out of our terrestrial being, right. temporary. We suspend our We suspend degree. and we move into that other realm. And this is indebted hugely to Bernini. So there's this really beautiful sort of coming together of architectural space of painting, of sculpture, of stained glass, of gilding, of color, just all of these sort of elements that become a kind of beautifully synthesized whole, as you said, which then suspends our movement. Here what we have is not just a sky that goes to infinity with clouds and an ultimate glow, a spiritual glow, of course, it's not just the sun up there, but it's, it's heaven, but the borders are ambiguous. And during Renaissance art, and certainly medieval art, this ambiguity was just out of the question. Nobody would say, well, do we shade it this way or that? Everything had to be clear. By this point in the history of art, so people knew what they were looking at in a more simple way, and it was fine to make things ambiguous. We don't know whether we're looking at shading up there or a painting of shade. We don't know for a moment. I've seen many people stop here and wonder whether those cherubs and angels are made of solid material or painted. And in fact, the fresco yeah. extends on wooden and other boards. It's like stage machinery and stage sets out of that central space and actually partly covering the, the vaulting of the ceiling. On top of that, the glaze, or I think in the first we would just call it a wash of darker paint, extends actually onto the architecture and um, creates the illusion shadows. that we're seeing the shadows from those clouds. I think about that joining of the spiritual realm and the earthly realm that happens in the Baroque softly. This is the church triumphant. The name of Jesus is the one thing we must follow, but if you are blind to it, if you reject it, if you refuse it, being a different religion, this is very, it's very political, or um, mm -hmm. just ignorance or obtuseness, you are the, the rejected and you're even the damned. And you are those figures who are falling out of that sky into shade, into shadowed areas up there already, and ultimately falling down, down to earth and below that into hell. Uh, triumphalism is, is the theme here. And it's not just in the 1600s, but it was established before that because the Protestant Reformation, which grew through the 1520s and 30s, is now over 100 years old. And we have major wars of religion in Europe. Hundreds of thousands of Christians are killing other hundreds of thousands of Christians. This was a very dramatic moment in, in European history. It's very hard to imagine, I think, that moment in European history, that moment of you must take sides. And that need to be so certain of your faith in a way. And I feel that here, I feel that kind of well, here we're in power, the, certainty. We're in the heart of Rome. Yeah. 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 We're gonna stop there uh, because they went through all the major points there. 
I saw some people dying down notes, which is great. I saw other people, I'm not sure if they were looking um, at the screen or not. But the, the one reason for showing you the video is so that you get that visual cue, too. And that's one of the things that some of you are struggling with on your essays is that visual evidence. And so please make sure that you are also, like, as you're taking notes, be looking up so that you can see what the heck they're talking about, right? So, what's the function of this church? It's not just any old church. What's the bigger function? What's the bigger function of this church? Juana, do you have that? I don't know if this counts as like a function, but it's like a mother church. It is. It is a mother church of the Jesuit order. And so the Jesuit order was a major uh, proponent of the Counter Reformation. They wanted to bring back the glory and the prestige of the Catholic Church after the Protestant Reformation, right? And so this is in the heart of Rome, right? It's in a central location. It's on a busy street. And so it stands out from its surroundings, right? Um, so it was made, right? Um, we know the patron was Farnese. Farnese were a major Roman family, kind of like the Medicis. Um, they were major patrons to the arts, and many of them rose in the ranks of the Catholic Church. And the one that was commissioned this was a cardinal. Um, so, how does the design reflect the function? We're going to pick this apart looking at the exterior, the interior, and the central painting, okay? So on the exterior here, right, we can see a slight variation from the style from the Renaissance, All right? So you can see some slight variation. Can anyone point out something that looks a little different than previous churches that we've looked at? Do you see any variations, any differences? The swirl patterns on the sides. Right. So we have these spirals, and the function of those is to connect the different levels of the church visually. And so that's a very common characteristic of the late Renaissance and the Baroque, is those spirals. Right? Any other things stand out to you? If you were going to look at this church, where do you think your eye is supposed to visually go? Where does your eye visually go when you look at the exterior of the church? Isabel, can you help me? Where does your eye go? Where does it land? Um, it sort of goes to like the middle section with like the doorway. Exactly. So in the Counter-Reformation, they're trying to bring back the flock. They want people to enter into the church. And so this, the portal, the entryways, become really emphasized. So we have classical architecture of um, pediments and grounded pediments. We've got, you know, pilasters becoming columns, and they become double to emphasize the center. We have multi layers of, you know, those pediments rounded, right? We have a big giant shield above the doorway that marks, right, who this church was dedicated to, as well as the patron. We have a window above the doorway that echoes the doorway, right? And the central door is bigger than the side doors, right? So there's this central focus focusing on getting people into the interior of the church, right? So you can see how there's a change from the Renaissance. This is just like the next step from the architecture of like Brunelleschi. Because that's pretty much the only other architecture piece we have, right? We didn't have a high Renaissance build, right? So the interior. When we looked at church formations, we really spent a lot of time doing this in the Gothic and the Romanesque, right? We looked at what the interior of the church looks like. 
What do you think the emphasis is on the interior looking at this plan? What's the biggest section? What's the biggest section? Alana, can you help me? What's the biggest section? Is it the circle area underneath the dome? It, there's the dome, but I would say not just the circle section, but pretty much the nave and the transept and the altar, kind of like the whole central part of it is the thing that stands out. And that also relates to the Counter-Reformation, right? There is an emphasis on individual spirituality in the Counter-Reformation. You go to church to, you know, be indoctrinated in the Catholic philosophy and, and feel, um, you know, uh, education, right? And it's really important that you hear and understand the mass, right? And so there's big wide maze, there's big wide interior spaces that focuses your attention towards the altar so that you can focus on the mass. Now, what I think is hilarious is that interior space and that painting, I think I would have a hard time focusing on the mass because it is just absolutely beautiful on the interior, right? This is definitely a space that's overwhelming when you go into it. I mean, personally, right, the Sistine Chapel is absolutely gorgeous, but when you walk into one of these Baroque Counter-Reformation churches, it's like you're being put into another world. Because it is, like I said, this kind of multimedia extravaganza. So the architect, um, the Cup la Porta, on the, he did the exterior. Then we have another architect on the interior. And I hope AP never asks you for the names of all these artists, because there's three for just this one place. So the interior is mostly Giacomo del Vignola. And so he designed the interior format and the interior architecture. And so, of course, he's just taking all of the same plays from the playbook of the Renaissance. Pilasters, rounded arches, dome, barrel vaulting, right? And he's focusing your attention on that altar. And then the painting, right? The painting is by Gowley. And so, like they said in the video, right? This is more than meets the eye, right? This is much, much more than what you think you are seeing, right? So, this is painting, painted section in the middle is fresco, right? So, he's just learning from Michelangelo, right? He's just taking it up another level, right? So, we have this illusionistic space in the central part, that's all fresco, that's all painted, okay? Notice how the colors change based on the lighting. And so we have the, you know, the content here, we have God, right, or Jesus' name. Kind of, instead of a halo, we have basically light coming down from the heavens, right? Then we have people, right, moving into the heavens. So this is kind of like a last judgment scene, right? Instead of focusing on damnation, this is supposed to be a celebration of the triumphs of heaven, right? So all of these people, right, or I shouldn't say all of these people, most of these people that you see on the interior are all uh, fresco. But what does the video say about these people who are covering up the architecture? Where are they painted? Eva, did you remember what they said on the video? Um, those are like the rejected or the damned. Exactly. And they're not painted on the ceiling. They're painted on pieces of wood. So like theater production, right, where you kind of have like sets, there's these flat pieces of wood that he painted on to create the illusion of the damned going to hell and the, the people going to heaven. So we have people painted on these pieces of board that overlap the real architecture. So unlike, right, so unlike 
Michelangelo, all this stuff on the ceiling is real. All these coiffer, all this ornamentation is real. A lot of it is stucco, which is kind of like a plaster material that's easy to sculpt. It's very cheap, but it's very easy to sculpt so that it can be really decorative. And so then Gowley painted those faux shadows. So he made cast shadows to make the scene seem more realistic. Right? So we've got painting, we've got wood panels, right? We've got real architecture. And then we also have kind of like sculptural relief. Because like Eva was saying, we have those damn people. So all of this that's in monochrome with black and white, often some of those are sculpted. So they're sculpted in stucco. They kind of look 3D. And they're all falling into our space. So that's that kind of interactive quality that's so common in the room. Right? Is that you as the viewer become a participant in the scene. So you can see that glow as it reaches up. This is probably a better view where you can really see how complex, right, and how many of these fallen are coming down into your space. Right? And that's just the next step from the last judgment by Michelangelo. Okay, the questions on Il Hezu. Okay, we're going to speed through um, a little bit of St. Peter's just because I think it's important. Remember that um, Julius II demolishes St. Peter's. That's the mother church of the Catholic Church, right? And so he demolishes it. And so he hired Vermonte and then Michelangelo eventually to design it so that it can be built. It didn't really get finished until the Baroque period. And the architect that is best known for it is named Mondriano. And so what you can see is the central plan, which is like the element of perfection that Alberte was talking about, that it'd be a central plan, it's kind of the symbol of heaven, doesn't work for the Counter-Reformation. Because if you want to glorify the church, you've got to have common circumstances. You've got to have big processional. So notice how he added a long central nave. Right? So we can see them moving away from the central plan format and kind of going back to that basilica. Okay? So this is the exterior of St. Peter's. Um, when you go to St. Peter's, has anyone been to Rome? No? Okay. When you go to St. Peter's um, in the future, you don't necessarily see the church because it's humongous and the church is in a valley. You get your best views when you're up on one of those seven hills of Rome, which is where this photo was taken. Um, when you walk into the Vatican, the thing that you notice first is the large piazza. This is designed by the, the sculptor Bernini. And so this is supposed to look like the arms of the mother church embracing its faithful. And so they are all a colonnade. So it's a series of columns with a roof. And then you get to the entryway of St. Peter's. That colossal dome that Michelangelo designed, you can't really see when you're in the piazza because this church is enormous. It's got a focus once again on the center, and he staggered the columns so that they get closer and closer as you move to the central portal. Now on the interior, Bernini, right, Bernini, who we have in our 250 with the ecstasy of St. Teresa, he designed a tabernacle. This covers the altar, but also covers the tombs of the popes. So the popes are buried in a crypt underneath the central altar. And he also, um, we saw it in the last video, in the altar area, he designed this seat for St. Um, for St. Peter. So that kind of represents all the popes. Because St. Peter 
was considered the first pope of the Catholic Church. So this is all in bronze. So the, all that stuff that looks like fabric is really bronze. So this is a good example of kind of like multimedia extravaganza. This sculpture has bronze, but it also has stained glass. It also has rods of bronze that emulate the light shining through that central stained glass window. Okay, so this is Bernini. What do you think the subject matter of Bernini is here? This is not in the 250, but based on other imagery you've seen, what do you think this is? What do you think this David. is? It's definitely David. Thank you. So it is David. Um, and so this is a great example of the difference between the Renaissance and Baroque, right? So Renaissance is all cool, calm, collected, perfect, and Baroque is all dramatic. How is it dramatic? How is it dramatic? What's your visual evidence? Aaron, what do you think? What's the visual evidence? How is the David on the right dramatic? I say with the exaggerated poses. Right. Um, yeah. So the pose, this pose is that climactic moment of the story where the stone is being released from the sling. And so he actually carved, wrote, right? Bernini was a masterful sculptor, right? And you also see the determination on his face, right? He's like really into it as his body spirals to release that rock, right? Um, this, here's a, a few more examples of his work. This is Apollo and Daphne. This is my favorite Bernini. I, I believe this is in the Farnese Palace. So the same Farnese from Little Zoo. You can see how it kind of spirals visually, and she's being transformed into a tree. Her toes transform into roots, and her fingers, delicate little leaves come from it. So he sculpted and carved marble to look like leaves. Right? Um, here's Persephone, which you can see how flesh becomes real flesh. Um, there's a lot of fountains in Rome um, supplied by those aqueducts, and many of them were designed by Bernini. This one's in um, the Piazza Navona, and it signifies the, the four major rivers from the continent. Right? So here we have kind of the stereotypical Baroque piece. So we have sculpture, architecture, and painting. And that leads us to the Ecstasy of St. Teresa by Bernini. Right? This is the Coronaro Chapel, and they give you the exterior shot of this. So we probably need to put some characteristics on this, right? What's emphasized once again in this Baroque church? What stands out? Where does our eye visually go? Jasmine, Jasmine, what do you think? Where'd your eye go? Into the top of the portal. Into the top of the portal. So notice how severe the stairs are. Look how they angle to the door. There's no porch for you to hang out on the side of the door. Visually, it all goes to the door. It's colossal. We've got shields. We've got pediments. We've got double entablature. We've got the window, and then we've got the pediment at the top. And then once again, we have those scrolls connecting those levels. So it's really asking you to come inside, right? And so when we look at the interior of the Carnaro Chapel, what are the different medias that we see to create the overall effect? What medias do you see? What component of art? 
This is that multimedia extravaganza we're talking about. Let's start at the top. What's this? Can my cursor? What's that? Emily, what do you think? There is some stucco, but that's painting. So we have the Holy Spirit, this little dove. It's painted with illusionism in the ceiling. And then we have the stucco underneath that. And that combines it with the, what does the stucco overlap on? The wall, right? And the architecture. So we've got fresco painting, we've got architecture, we've got sculptural relief, illusionism with the stucco. And then of course, what's this? In the very center, made out of marble. What's that? What would you classify that as what kind of art form? We have a sculpture, correct? Right? So we have sculpture, we've got architecture, we've got painting, and we even have stained glass. Right? So we have a lot of different media to create that overall effect. So when it comes to sculpture, not only do we have marble, but we also have bronze behind it. Okay, so he uses all of these media in a very theatrical sort of way, right? So on the sides, right? So this is kind of the central, we're talking about the sides right here, okay? He basically made boxes for the patrons. It looks like the interior of a theater. So he's got the Carnaros, right? Hence the name of the chapel. Who are the patrons and so they look very classical don't they sitting there in their classical robes in sculptural form and then behind them it looks like it's probably bronze we have a depiction of the illusionistic space in relief right and then in the center we have the stage and then in the stage we have the story of the ecstasy of St. Teresa. She looks like she is on, right? She's like on display, but she's like on a stage. And then there's architecture around her, okay? And the stage is lit by spotlights kind of coming from underneath, but it also incorporates a real window. So behind this altar, you can see it kind of peeking through right here. There's a stained glass window, and that's what we have on the exterior on the left here. And so there's a real window, and that window is supposed to be shining in the light of God. And so he uses bronze rods, and that's what you see here coming through. So this is a continuation of that light from the stained glass window. Right? And so how does this reflect the Counter-Reformation? Right? How does this reflect the counter information? Does anyone know what the story is of St. Teresa? Anyone know? We could watch the smart history, but I think we'll be okay without it. She basically, St. Teresa, felt God, and she said it felt like she was being pierced by arrows. She said it was a good pain. Right? And so St. Teresa was a contemporary of the day. She was one of the first, basically, saints to kind of come out of this Baroque period of the Counter-Reformation. And she was a major proponent of, um, you know, bringing back the glory of the church. And so she said that when she converted to Christianity, that she actually, you know, was contacted by God. And so this is that moment where she feels the pain of God. So an angel is piercing her with a bronze arrow. And then she's kind of laying on a cloud, right? 
And this ecstasy component is very sensual, right? Kind of relates back being touched by God to kind of like something physical that humans could relate to, right? Kind of like earthly passions. So here you can see Bernini's mastery of carving um, marble. Notice how fluid the drapery is on the angel. And then how we have all that undulating fold of St. Teresa, and then that moment of ecstasy on her face. Okay. Um, I would say if you have time to watch that smart history, I think you'll really enjoy it. Okay. I feel like. I've talked way too much today, but that's okay. We have our, I think our last building um, for architecture. And so we're gonna look at San Carlo El Quattrofonte. Um, this is on a major street in the city of Rome. And the architect for this is Baronini. Now, it's confusing. We just had a sculptor named Bernini, and now we have Baronini. Right? So you have to remember two artists with a B that sound very, very similar. Right? So I feel like I keep asking the same question. However, what about the exterior tells us that it's the, a church from the Counter Reformation? Right? How does this church represent the Counter Reformation? What are our visual clues? Maroon, can you give me one? Yeah, it's, so it's like very dramatic with the architecture and has like classical elements. And then there's also like a focus on the portal again. Exactly. I feel like we've, we've talked about that three times, so I'm really glad you got that. So we have our classical vocabulary, our pediments and entablatures and columns. Um, we have um, the dramaticness of that exterior uh, with all those undulating curves. And then we have um, that central focus on the portal or in the doorway. And so Barabini is probably, you know, the most revered of the Baroque architects from Italy. And the reason is that he's an innovator. How is his church's exterior different than the Coronado Chapel or El Jesu? How is it different? I might have just mentioned it. What's different about it? Katie, can you help me? What's different about the exterior compared to El Jesus? Um, it looks more dramatic. And just, yeah. How how is it dramatic? What do you think? How? Um, it's just like more complex. Like there's a lot more like decoration kind of, and it looks more three D. Right. There's definitely a lot more decoration. There's a massive shield at the top, right? Massive shield. There's a lot more architecture of decoration and sculptures on the facade. But the key for knowing Barolini is that organic nature of the architect. Notice how undulating that entablature is. It does not have a flat facade. It has convex and con concave curves to the exterior and the interior. It is not a basilica. It is not a central plan church. It basically is two equilateral triangles together that have been curved. And so it too still has kind of that emphasis on the um, mass. There's no side chapels, there's no side aisles. It's just one big open interior space. You can see how it's connected to um, other sort of uh, buildings and structures that are related to the church, like a cloister. It's named Quadrifanta because it actually has a fountain on the corner, and that's where its name comes from. This is the interior, right? Once again, still very traditional, classical characteristic. However, 
It does not have flat surfaces. It has those concave and convex lines. And then the best part about it is the oval dome in the top. So very few Barley um, buildings look like everyone else. He is not going to use a circle, right? So he uses an oval and he uses coifers. And notice how the coifers are a bunch of octagons and crosses, right? So of course, crosses being symbolic of Christianity that lead up to a bronze, oops, I need to have a that, a bronze dove that represents the Holy Spirit. This is St. Evo by Borromini. Here's the dome of the interior of that one. You can see undulating surfaces, not circular. It's based on an ancient Roman temple. Uh, Piazza Navona has this, remember it from, this used to be a horse track in ancient Rome. That's the Bernini sculpture of the Four Rivers. This is a Borromini building right there. This one's a little bit more typical, um, characteristic of Baroque. It's not as undulating, but still a little bit different. Okay. So that kind of a little bit faster because we've seen so many of the same sort of characteristics. Now we're going to look at some paintings. So we've looked at Baroque painting in Italy. We've looked at Baroque sculpture. Now we're going to focus on, excuse me, architecture, sculpture, and I'll focus on painting. Okay, so in Rome, there's two different styles that are very common. I would say that Gauli, right, that we saw in Il Hezu, is a good example of this kind of illusionistic ceiling. This is the Karachi, this is Annabelle Karachi, and he's basically painting like Michelangelo. How is this similar to the work of Michelangelo? How is it similar to like the Sistine Chapel? What do you think? It's divided into scenes and they're separated by painted architecture. Exactly, very good. So, but the other style that becomes dominant is the story, excuse me, the style of Caravaggio, right? And so this is very characteristic of some of the things we saw in Spain, and we're going to see a lot of the characteristics of this um, outside of Rome and into um, Flanders and Holland in Dutch painting, right? So here we have Caravaggio. Here's a nice self-portrait by him. Um, very similar to Michelangelo. He was kind of a difficult individual. Um, Caravaggio was um, kind of a rough, rough character. Um, he tended to paint real people, which is one of the reasons why he was often very controversial. A lot of his patrons didn't like how he made people seem too real. real. Um, sometimes his paint, like he would paint a saint um, or a martyr or some other sort of religious figure, and he would use a model that would maybe be like someone who lived on the streets. And so they weren't always pleased with the end result. But also, he was basically a criminal. He murdered someone over a tennis match and he had to flee to Naples. Um, and so he's a pretty controversial character, right? But here you can see some of his, his style. He's really known for his naturalism. And so naturalism is basically realism. It's like a heightened sense of realism, right? So this is Bacchus, right? You know Bacchus from classical times? Um, how does this Bacchus seem like a real person that you might see on the street? You're not, you're not used to seeing guys with flowers in his hair and leaves and in classical robes, but is there anything about him that seems like he's a real guy? Let me suggest that you look at his skin tone on his face, on his hands, and on his chest. What's going on with his hands and his arms? Okay. 
one out. He's got a farmer's camp. Can you see that? This is a street urchin. So his model is going to be someone who lives on the street. He's going to pay him very little money to sit there and be a model for him. And so instead of making his skin creamy and soft like his chest, right? Instead, he shows the sunburn and the tan on his hand. It kind of makes sense for Bacchus because he overdoes it on drinks to give him a little bit of a rosier sort of complexion, right? But that's probably too. He lives on the street, so he's got a suntan. Right? Um, here is his Judith and Holoferns. We'll talk about Artemisia genelesti and we'll compare that in just a second. Okay. But this has a style that we call tenebrism. And so for Caravaggio's image um, of the calling of St. Matthews, one of the formal characteristics of this is this tenebrism. Tenebrism is extreme chiaroscura, a difference between light and dark. So, how is lighting used in a dramatic fashion? What does lighting tell us about this scene? What does the lighting do? It highlights what? Getting to that part of the day. We've seen too much, we've talked too much. I've talked. Doesn't it have like a theatrical spotlight quality to it that tells us what's going on? It identifies the dramatic moment. And so Judith is cutting off the head of Holofernes here. So we see a spotlight on the terror in his face, his body, and her face going, ew, this is gross. I don't know what I'm doing. Why am I doing this? Ew. Right? So this is in um, a chapel in Rome. And so there's two, actually three famous Caravaggios here. The two most famous are on the side. This is the call, excuse me, this is um, the conversion um, scene. And then here is the crucifixion of St. Peter's, right? And St. Peter was not, he was crucified as well, like Jesus, but he didn't want to be crucified in the same fashion. So he was crucified upside down. And here is the picture that we have in the 250. Right? So this is the calling of St. Matthew. We'll end with this one today. Okay? So let's figure out the story. What is taking place in this scene? What's taking place? I'm going to have you guys start on the right. Look at the right of this painting and move to the left. What do we think is taking place? Okay, Raphael, can you help me? What do you think is taking place on the right side? Can you tell? Um, well, they're, point, they're pointing to the soldier on the left, so I, I would guess that like some kind of argument. Okay, so we have a pointing. This is a very common subject matter of the Counter-Reformation. We call these conversion scenes, right? And so this is called the calling of St. Matthew. So this is Jesus calling Matthew to become one of his followers. So those two, two people over here is Jesus and Peter, right? Jesus, I know it's Jesus because what's floating above his head? There's a little line there, which is his halo. So we have Jesus, right, over here, and he's pointing his hand towards Matthew, who's this guy right here. What I love about this is Caravaggio is creating a reference to Michelangelo. Look at the hand gestures. This is the creation of man. This is God's hand and Adam's hand, just in different positions in the painting, right? And so we have our haggard 
we typically see uh, Peter being represented as older, right? And so we have him there. And then we have a scene like, what the heck is the setting here? Where's Matthew hanging out? Where would you say this takes place? Can you help? Uh, yeah, sorry, you cut out there. What was the question again? I said, where do you think this is? Like, where, where do you think this version is taking place? It looks like some kind of like bar or like less than reputable kind of place. Exactly, which is totally characteristic of the roughness of Caravaggio. So he sets this in a, like a, a saloon, a bar. And so St. Matthew, he was a tax collector. He's hanging out with other tax collectors. He's showing off his pretty legs again. I don't know if you guys remember that from the Faccio. Kind of rushed through that. And he's wearing the latest of French fashion. This was made for a French church in Rome. In, in Rome, there's a bunch of uh, neighborhoods. Um, you know, because of course, a lot of people from all around the world, Europe, I should say, today, all around the world, come to Rome. Um, and there's all these ethnic, um, neighborhoods um, because people worked at the church and, and so this was in a French neighborhood in the city of Rome so they're wearing French fashion so here we have that conversion he's calling for Matthew to come and follow him to leave his sinful ways right and so you can see that, like thinking about location right thinking about location you're in a chapel Right? You're in a small chapel, only a part of the church. And notice the location of the painting. It is close to you. So you're going to be viewing it, looking at that scene, and trying to see yourself in that painting. Right? So how is it Baroque? What are the Baroque characteristics? Right? It's a very dramatic moment of the story. Right? It's a moment of religious conversion. Right, which is a, a common Counter Reformation theme. It has that dramatic chiaroscuro, where we have the dramatic spotlight that illuminates the most important parts of the story. It also takes place in a contemporary setting made for that French neighborhood in Rome. So it's made for personal experiences for the people who live in that neighborhood. So here we have the hands, right, those the gestures, right? Here's some other images. We've got dirty feet and fingernails, right? Total naturalism, over the top realism. You can see that a lot of these compositions are really up front so that you notice the most important parts. Okay, so we're going to stop there. Thank you for being patient today. We got through a lot. We'll continue with 77.